Okay. I like to call this um, the Historic Resource Commission uh, meeting of April 7th, uh, 2006, to order. Um, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll, please? Alberta Christie. Here. Sean Coolidge. Present. Monica Garcia. Here. Lawrence Hitterdale. Here. Edward Morashi. Here. Mike Tardiff. Phil Schaefer. Yes. Lynette Verino. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Oh, here comes Mike. Mike's <laughs> here. <laughs> Commissioner Tarp is here. Okay. Um, Commissioner Garcia. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Well, we I don't see any member of the public for public okay. comments, so we can move on. Um, the next one is the consent calendar for approval of the minutes of January uh, 28, 2016. Madam Chair, I move approval. Uh, moved by Commissioner um, Verino. Is there a second? Okay, and second by Commissioner Hitherdale. All those in favor say aye. 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 And I'm abstaining because I wasn't there. Okay. Here. Commissioner Schaefer and Commissioner Coolidge are to abstain. The motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you for excusing us last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, that's the consent calendar. Um, the certified. Do we have to take that separately, or is it under the consent calendar? Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. And right now, I'd like to call uh, Holly Sobleski for our historic resource commissioner training for 2016. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. We're going to do a fun one this evening, uh, but rest assured that I do have a lot of historic categorizations and designations coming up for you in July. Today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the architectural styles that are the most prevalent in Santa Ana. Now, there, there are a lot of different styles that you have heard about, seen some places on TV or heard talked about. We use the styles that are recognized by the National Register of Historic Places. So some of the terminology out in the world might be different than what, than what we use, but we tend to stick with just what the National Register uses. So the first style is also the earliest that we have here in Santa Ana. It's Italianate, which is a very late Victorian style. You could see um, those are some of the oldest homes, like the Granville Spurgeon House is, is a, an Italianate style. It very often has is an angular and square massing. It has very tall, skinny windows. And most commonly, uh, it has coins, which are the little um, um, things that you see on the corners of the building. They're usually either stone or large pieces of wood or block. And they also have a lot of uh, stylish window trim. The Minter House is also one of them. Stick East Lake or late, is also late Victorian, and it was a very common form of architecture uh, in the 19th century. Here you could see the common thing, theme is, again, we see the clabbered siding, but they did a lot of fancy gable trim and some work under the gable ends and you see a lot of horizontal banding on in terms of like, the balusters and uh, the porch lines. 
Queen Anne is probably the one that we're most familiar with here in Santa Ana because it's such a dramatic style. It usually has turrets and it has all different types of window shapes and styles. It still is very ornate. Uh, you could see at the, the Dr. Howe Waffle House, which is just a, a block away from us, that it has a lot of very decorative features around the windows, around doors, and along um, the all the um, balcony areas and things like that. It really, and you see a lot of late Victorian and Queen Anne styles all along in French Park as well. French Park was was developed during that era, and it was really was considered to be the fanciest, wealthiest part of town when it was first constructed. That's where many of the doctors and lawyers and politicians would live, is in French Park. So here you can see it's pointed out some of the, the most common features, which includes the turret and the uh, lots of embellishment around the, uh, openings, including doors and windows. Shingle style is not a very common one in Santa Ana. In fact, this is the only example of shingle style we have in Santa Ana is the Episcopal Church of the Messiah. It is also rather dramatic. You can see it's got some half timbering on that one portion of the front facade, and yet it's also got turrets on it. So it's got a mixture of Queen Anne and medieval type of features. The shingle style comes from the, the fact that it's got a lot of external shingling that are individually placed on. And so it's, it's not a wonder that we don't see a lot out here. It's very work intensive to construct these types of, of buildings. Uh, but we are lucky to have this one that's as fine as this type. Since we don't have any residential examples of shingle style, this is just um, one that is in our design guidelines. But it shows that they had a lot of masonry or stone foundations. They typically used double hung windows, but the windows were a little bit wider than you would see in the Victorian era. They also had very steeply a uh, steep gabled roof with a cross gable, so they were often L-shaped. And a lot of the uh, properties had porches or open areas for people to enjoy the outside, which really was part of the whole shingle style movement. Colonial Revival style was actually a, a, an architecture movement that went directly against the ornateness of the Victorians. It was meant to simplify, be as co for the common man, but it's still definitely, you can see these are very large Colonial Revival homes, but they, they were meant to get away from the ornate carvings and decorations around windows and such. So the Colonial Revival houses here were really were in reaction a rebellion of sorts to the Victorian era. They were built in Santa Ana between 1905 and 1910. And here are a couple of examples here in Santa Ana, the Armstrong House. And that one also has Dutch influences by having a gambled roof line, which is the same as similar as a barn would have. But you can see it's a very horizontal, simple lines. The only ornateness you would see on a colonial revival would be the fenestration patterns being very similar across the entire facade. It had very simple, um, usually Doric columns in the front, in the front porch, and it had pediment features on the front porch as well, which is that triangle you see, that's the pediment. Sometimes the, the features would be a triangle with the bottom that the ends didn't touch, and that would be a broken pediment. But that was also very common to a colonial revival style. So you could see here is another example of just um, what makes a colonial revival. And again, it's that uh, gabled front porch, the rectangular styling. It usually was stucco, I mean, uh, clabbered siding, but it could have been brick. Uh, very, very symmetrical. All the, the front facade is very balanced on colonial revivals. Often the most um, ornate thing on it besides the front porch is going to be the fireplace, and you might see some very dramatic fire or chimneys on colonial revival styles. And here's an example in this drawing of the broken pediment on the side gable. 
classical revival was a movement that dates back to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. I really think I should have been born that time because this is just one of my favorite styles. Uh, it is designed to bring back some of, that's why they called it revival, bring back some of those old styles that were happening around medieval times or earlier or later that were very common period to their past and they just wanted to bring them back but they modernized them using some of their own features. California in particular uh, was fond of um, different kinds of revivals. In classical revival you often saw a grand front entry again with the pedimented gable but unlike the colonial revival you can see that it's, it's much more um, vertical. Uh, including that front porch. Double hung windows with six over six were very common to that time. And you could see that in this case, the, the uh, porch supports were columns that were unfluted or they didn't have the little grooves curved into the, the columns themselves. But again, it was really a very simple style. It was just somewhat more grand. The craftsman style, I think, is the most interesting and is very, very common here in Santa Ana. Henninger Park is almost exclusively craftsman bungalows, and that's why it was uh, eligible to be a historic district. The craftsman houses in Santa Ana were built between 1905 and actually a little bit later than 25, probably up to the, the 30s. But they, they were representing um, sim simplicity in life by bringing the outdoors inside, by having a lot of wooden features on the interior. You'll see a lot of built-in cabinetry, fine, fine craftsman work on the inside and outside. And if you look carefully, you could see craftsman was also influenced by Japanese style architecture. And a lot of people were very surprised by that, but when you look at it and you see the knee braces, which are the, um, decorative wood that are holding up the gable ends. Those uh, really are si very similar to what archi uh, Japanese architecture. The only difference is it didn't have, typically didn't have the flared ends on the roof line. But to Santa Ana craftsmen, you would often see low-pitched gabled roofs. You'd see different kind of ornamentation like shingling or board and batten underneath the, the gable end to give it some um, to verticalize it somewhat, it would draw your eye upward. You also saw broad porches. It was really meant to bring the owner outside, to enjoy the outdoors, to sit on the front porch and watching the world go by and participate with your neighbors. They very often had um, um, exposed building elements like rafter tails would be open and sometimes decorative. But I think by far this is the most common style of architecture in Santa Ana. The prairie style is um, a style that was made popular by Frank Lloyd Wright, and it's one component of the prairie style is a style called American Foursquare. The difference between the Foursquare and the prairie style is usually that the Foursquare has a broad front porch that's or a front porch that is centered on the, on the facade, front facade, whereas prairie style is more like the house you see on the right, where it still has a porch, but the building is much more, um, the massing is more uh, stable and more squared off. And you typically would see a dormered window up above, like on the Kittle Perkins house. That was very common to that particular style. Again, you would see uh, details that would emphasize the horizontal lines. You would see the single-story porch that was usually typically centered on the front facade if it was American Foursquare. And it also had um, even the eaves and the cornice lines and things like that also emphasized the horizontal. Tudor and English Revival, those are some of the most dramatic styles we have in Santa Ana. They were very common to have wooden roofs, which many of our, our properties here in Santa Ana still do. We do allow wood roofing even in modern times. It just has to be treated so that it doesn't easily catch fire or spread. But Tudor homes in the beginning actually had thatched roofs. 
They were natural materials. They were very good insulation material, but it um, tended to draw rodents. <laughs> so the wood was an upgrade from that. And in the um, uh, English and tu specifically Tudor Revival styles, you would see a lot of the half timbering, which in the originally were meant to be structural members that you would see. They would build that sort of um, triangular type structure and fill it all in with plaster and that was what held the house up. Now, of course, it's just modern decoration. Uh, but there usually would be a very prominent front window, multi-lights on the, on the windows themselves, a very grand chimney. Sometimes you see the, the Tudors and they would even have double chimneys in fantastic shapes and uh, decorative bricks. The Zlacket House is probably one of the most unique that we have anywhere in Orange County, I would say. The Zlacket House is a very, has a very fanciful roof line. Again, it is all, um, the current one is just redone, it's all wood. And this, the picture, in this picture you can see it's, it's aged a little bit, so it's a little more wood is on the gray side, but they have redone the front portion of it, which I might add cost the property owner um, uh, $50,000 for just the front portion of it. They couldn't afford to do the entire roof because it was so expensive. It entailed having a carpenter go up there and cut each shingle individually to fit. So it's, it's very expensive and time consuming, but it's, you could see it's, it's just exquisite once it's, when it's done properly. Uh, this one is, is a storybook variant of Tudor and English revival styles. Italian Renaissance Revival, I would say the only place we see this particular style is in Floral Park. It tends to be a much larger, grander home. It, it makes use of coins and window surrounds and door surrounds using a contrasting material like stone or brick. It's usually stucco, has um, not a very steep roof line at all because it's all about massing with Italian Renaissance. The Spencer House on the right hand side there, just to, to let you know, was our very first recipient of a Mills Act that was in Floral Park. So here you could see that they had very classic columns, very symmetrical. Um, again, the fenestration patterns like Colonial Revival were very constant and balanced and they was a very boxy type style. Mediterranean style is also very common in Santa Ana. We have some very large ones like the Joe Lowell, which is an unusual Pueblo variant uh, of the uh, Spanish colonial style. And we also have very small ones, some of which you'll see in um, Wilshire Square, Washington Square. Uh, Basically, the two main categories of this style are going to be the Mission Revival, and for those, that, what sets those apart from the others is a large parapet. It'll usually have a flat roof with a parapet. Sometimes it's decorative at the, or curvaceous at the top of the parapet, but the Spanish colonial typically has a gabled roof, or if it has a flat roof, will have a lot of balconies or balconettes. It will have a lot of um, wood beams, that again, originally were meant to be structural beams that held up the second floor, but now are typically just for decoration. Here's an example of the mission-shaped dormer. You can see it's got the curvaceous up at the top. And you, the uh, grills on the windows are also very common. They make good use of uh, heavy wood doors and wrought iron to decorate the, the windows and doors. Typical of a Spanish colonial, the finish on the exterior is almost always smooth, hand troweled smooth. These, these buildings were built mainly in the 1920s when the air compressor hadn't yet been, been invented. So people did the, put the plaster on by hand. It usually had a little bit more lime or something in it than it does nowadays. Now it's all prefab and you may just mix it and put it on but you will still see every so often a light dash finish on a Spanish uh, colonial. And when it's done right, it looks very good, but it's done completely by hand. Imagine how, work, how much work that took to make it look like it was sprayed on with an air compressor because it's so even. 
in terms of the little bumps on top of it, but um, they were done by hand. There's several of those in, in Floral Park. Also, they usually had the clay barrel tiles or S tiles, and I'm very picky about that in design for design when someone comes in that we don't want to see someone put uh, barrel tiles on a craftsman home because it would be very inappropriate. It would be like putting a mini skirt on, on grandma. Mini skirt's good. <laughs> Grandma's good. <laughs> Me too. And so I, I look great in certain things, but a mini skirt isn't one of them. So um, I'm very careful about that, and I also am careful about the newer tiles, even though sometimes they they have the little wave go into them. They, they're too flat. They look too modern. They look too shiny. They don't look anything like the original clay. So on a historic home, I'm actually going to make them go and get some clay tiles and put it back. Uh, on a non-historic property, I'm at least going to pay attention to the style of the roof so that we don't get something completely inappropriate. And you can see on the Spanish colonial, also you see a lot of arches and openings and multi-pane casement windows. Sometimes those are steel, which are uh, a real pain for people to try to replace now. So if you know of a good craftsman that is able to fix windows that are steel, please let me know so I can keep that in my back pocket when people need that. Modern or streamlined modern is a really a nice style that was built in the World War II years. And if you look especially at the Wagner house on the right hand side, you can see the, the portal window. And you even just looking at that particular house, you can see the, the Navy influence on it, the wartime influence on architecture. And so this is really where you can see how society itself, what's, what the world is happening in the world is actually affecting architecture. The Maharaja house, I'm sure you are familiar with, was actually owned by the Maharaja of Indore. And just so if you don't or don't know the story, he came here and had this house built specifically in Santa Ana because Santa Ana had some of the highest quality schools in the United States. And he wanted to come here and have his daughter um, raised with this high quality schooling. Now the uh, house is uh, owned by a uh, couple of doctors and they've made some inappropriate modifications to it over the years, but I think we've gotten to a happy place and we want to stay there. But as you can see, the modern or streamlined modern typically had a flat roof style, very often had, uh, again, steel windows, um, which actually, if you think about it, was somewhat unusual because steel was very expensive and hard to come by during World War II. So this was when they, you do see the steel windows during this time period, it was definitely a sign of class of um, upper class uh, wealth, and they were flaunting it with the windows. You could see the flat roof, a lot of horizontal lines and grooves. The portal windows were meant to mimic, mimic uh, submarines and ships. And you saw a lot of glass block. There's some additional homes in this style along Main Street, North Main. Art Deco is another uh, Depression era style. You see a lot of this in our downtown, but uh, as probably most of you are familiar, it's not because most of those buildings were built in the 1930s. It's because in 1933 there was the Long Beach earthquake, which destroyed much of the facades of our downtown buildings. And the most popular style at the time was this Art Deco style. So most of the, the buildings you see in downtown that are of this, this style were had the facades completely redone due to that earthquake. You can see it's a um, very vertical um, type of style and it has um, a lot of chevrons and fluting around the window shape specifically. It had very smooth stucco surfaces. Again, uh, it was hand applied. You also saw a lot of zigzags and uh, decorative features around window openings or door openings. It's a very distinctive style. The international style is really was one of function over form, and it was meant to be um, very much a simple style, to, uh, and you see it in a lot of our civic buildings in Santa Ana. Um, the 
to some degree, the the, old, the new courthouse, the, the Orange County Courthouse, is in a similar type of international style. It's a more modern type, Neutra, but it um, it still is in a, a flavor of the international style. Um, we don't have a lot of residential examples of that style. It, actually, you don't see it that very often at all. But usually, there's very little decorative features. The windows are very simple. It is um, not meant to be decorative. It's sort of meant to just be their stark against nature. Minimal traditional is um, probably one of the most common in Santa Ana as well. It was devised right after World War II. It was meant to get servicemen and their families into homes as fast as possible. Where I live in Long Beach, there is an entire neighborhood that is just plan A and plan B and plan C, and they just took it and turned them, turned them this way, turned them that way, but everybody had the exact same floor plans, exact same look. They might have changed the window style or something like that, but they were basically the same home. That was really in reaction to a lot of the servicemen coming home and they needed to, to a home to build and they wanted to build quickly. And so minimal traditional is also, if you notice, starting to move towards the ranch style. It's starting to become more horizontal, again, leaning towards um, oneness with nature, uh, being a part of the landscape rather than sticking out from the landscape. You can see here there's a single chimney, has a low pitch roof, uh, and sometimes they don't even have any eaves at all. It'll just be very close, or, or they may have boxed eaves. So finally we have the ranch style, which um, originated in California. Even though it, it started in the 30s, it really did not come to Santa Ana until the 40s and 50s. And it did become a very predominant style for California, which again, this style is reflecting what was happening in the world. There was a lot of um, flight from urban cities. People were moving out into these new suburbs of which Santa Ana is a part of. And so we are a suburb of Los Angeles. And so as a result, People were looking for larger properties, sprawling properties. They wanted to have sort of a country type feel without really being in the country. So they wanted to have their shopping close, but they wanted to have their big lots, their own home. And the ranch style was reflective of that because it was a sprawling, horizontal property. It looked very, very large from the outside because of that. But it was low to the ground and it, um, Again, it was blending with nature rather than competing with it. Even in terms of the exterior materials that were used, stucco and stone and wood and some brick accents, but it also was meant to sort of blend with the landscape. And you can see here it talks about having wide eaves, but really modest detailing at the windows and doors. The detail, any detailing was typically along the horizontal band on the front of the facade or in one um, consult, con concentrated space in, on the front facade. And that concludes the presentation on architecture. I'm sure that all of you now are gonna be driving around on the weekend. You're gonna go, I know that style, I know that style. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Madam Chair? Yes. Oh, uh, Commissioner I, Taylor? I have a question. Go ahead. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're fortunate in Santa Ana to have so many um, historic homes and, and such a variety of, of those homes and buildings. Um, I was wondering if there are any Eichler-type homes in Santa Ana, if they're considered uh, historic as well. We do have uh, some of them that are Eichler-esque, uh, specifically over in Park Santiago. There's several of them in there that have the tall um, transom-type windows that, that are just along the uh, horizontal band along the upper, and they'll have sometimes even the front facade is is tilted to to make it look like it's at an angle to the to the horizon, and they'll have a lot. Um, Instead of having columns, they'll have actual posts, uh, concrete posts that look as though they're holding up the facade. They, we do have some. We have not had any nominated or designated as of yet, but I hopefully soon. Thank you. 
Well, they would be considered then. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. There's a beautiful one on Sharon Road that really should be on the registry. They got mine on their door. <laughs> <laughs> encourage them. But it looks very eye-progressive. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Hallie. We learn so much from you every mm -hmm. time you take the podium and so forth. Okay. Okay. Um, we have that. Uh, moving on with the agenda. We don't have any absences. Everybody's here. Hassan, hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, comments, staff member comments. I have one quick comment. Okay. Candidate Neal, our planning manager, is away, so she's asked um, me to cover this evening. I'd like to take the opportunity, Madam um, Chair Christie, to introduce a new member of our planning staff. Her name is Jill Arabe. She comes to us from the city of Huntington Beach. So I'd like to please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, and we, we've brought her here. Uh, her expertise, her current job duties are going to be um, her urban design skills that she's bringing uh, for development projects and hopefully some long-range planning as well. Great. Do you have any comments, uh, Teal? Do you want to say? Um, I'm glad to be here, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not really prepared. I'm not very good at <laughs> Well, thank well you. welcome. Welcome. We welcome you, and we look forward to working with you. Okay. Uh, next, it's any commissioner uh, comments. Let me start with Commissioner Hitterdale. Uh, yes. Well, I want to thank Molly for the presentation. Very uh, helpful, and as well as very interesting. Commissioner Coolidge. I want to say thank you again for that awesome presentation. Um, every time you speak, I learn something, so thank you very much for that. Um, as you guys, to our very packed audience here, I would like to share um, <laughs> that the downtown Santa Ana Farmers Market is going to be open, reopening uh, next Sunday, which is the 17th. And you know, Grand, our, we don't have a packed house, but each one of us is a community leader. So if you just tell one or two people, then that could turn into you know, 10 to 20 people, and we'll have a packed opening. It's, uh, it's going to be a great year. We've moved it to Sunday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, it's definitely more about reaching out towards the community versus having a chef driven or catering to the restaurants. We noticed that this first go around that we had so much support from the local community when um, you know, we were anticipating chefs and restaurants to show up. And it was quite the opposite. And it was an amazing uh, turnaround. So uh, please show up, take some photos, Instagram it, and uh, have a great time. Thank you. And if I may add, the best bread in Southern California can yes. be found at that farmer's market, the best. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Schaefer. I, I would echo the comment about the bread. Um, really excellent. Uh, thank you, Holly, for a really um, thorough look at housing styles. And um, I hope that was very educational for a lot of people here. Um, I loved it, and it's a good reminder of little details that you know make something one style versus another. So uh, thank you for your expertise and sharing that. Um, I have two things I want to share is um, in a couple of weekends on the 23rd and 24th, I think mm -hmm. it is, the Floral Park Home and Garden Tour is coming up. I would encourage you all to uh, come and participate in that. It's a great uh, way, it's a great event to get to tour through some homes that are actually on the historic registry. I'm not saying they're all on the registry, but a lot, some of them are. And so that's a lot of fun to see. And then in um, May on the uh, 14th will be the West Floral Park Open Garden Day. So both those are very, very fun events. Uh, a lot of support from the community. Uh, there'll be street vendors and classic cars and you know all kinds of fun things. So also another good Instagram opportunity or whatever social media you like. Thanks. I heard somebody go no, this way. Uh, Commissioner Garino. Um, I just wanted, Sean, I, um, I'll go ahead and post that on Facebook to Washington Square website. So it's every Sunday starting the 17th, 10 to 2. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks. And then, uh, DTSA Farmers Market.com and on Instagram is everything DTSA Farmers Market. So. Okay. Commissioner Tariff. Uh, thank you, 
Chair uh, Christie. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Holly and staff for an interesting um, and informative uh, presentation. Very well done. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, I'll, I'll also, uh, Sean, note the uh, farmer's market on our, uh, on our neighborhood uh, website as you can promote that. So, thank you. Commissioner Garcia. Uh, thank you, Holly, for the presentation. I do have a quick question. Um, is this up on our website somewhere, like a public version? I think people would be interested in seeing this. Yes, it is. It's on the city's website, and if you go to uh, planning forms and applications, okay. it's called design guidelines, and this is under architectural styles. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Barachi. Again, I want to thank Holly. I learned a lot tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, welcome to Jill. And uh, hello, everybody, to the staff and the other commissioners, and uh, also the executive director, Son. It was great to see him yesterday over at the uh, Celebrate Santa Ana event. And uh, I just wanted to add to uh, Commissioner Schaefer's comment about the uh, home and garden tour. One of the things that's really fun to do is to sign up to be a docent because you also get to meet the homeowners, you get to learn a lot more about the house, and then you get to share that experience, and it almost becomes your house by the end of your shift, and then that gets you admission to the rest of the homes. So you get a free ticket. You get a free ticket, exactly. It's a wonderful event, so thank you. And I'd just like to say uh, welcome, Rosa. Thank you for filling in and taking the minutes and everything for us on that. Thank you, Hassan for letting her help us, okay? And then i just like to say um, that um, uh, yesterday for the um, uh, 2016 Santa Ana Community Building Awards at Santa Ana College yesterday, it was a tremendous success. Uh, with the vendors and everything else, the city was there and um, uh, all the others and uh, the recipients and awardees that we have were so deserving. We honored um, 13 of them. And we've uh, started the first legacy award uh, ever given in Santa Ana, and that went to Dr. Erlinda Martinez. Surprise, mm -hmm. now that she's retiring, but the things that she accomplished for the co uh, uh, community and um, uh, for the community and the students here is unprecedented in her term of, uh, she's only been here 11 years and what she has done and completed. And uh, I have the program if anybody's interested. And one of the other awards that was given out was to Kevin Cabrera, the executive director of the, of the Heritage Museum. I guess we have this treasure and what Kevin, since he's been there, have gone out to promote this and have renewed interest from the community of visiting there and also contributing to its success. One of the things that they've started there is a hydroponic garden, um, you know, because water is so precious nowadays. But these are some of the innovative ideas that he has brought to that. And he was one of, uh, as, um, executive director of the year uh, for um, his uh, contribution or his leadership in that historic, uh, uh, our historic treasure, the his, um, Heritage Museum. So uh, we were very pleased with that, <laughs> okay. Other than that, um, our next regularly scheduled meeting of the Historic Resource Commission is next on um, Thursday, July 7th at 4.30 p.m. here in the council chambers. If there's no other business, meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>